Good afternoon, everyone. If you can hear me, will you please type in the chat box? We were having some problems with our sound and I am wanting everyone to type in, just say, uh, I can hear you, Jody, in the chat box. I am hoping you can all hear me. We were having problems. Okay, you guys can hear me. That's fantastic. Uh, welcome to our webinar. We are on a different kind of platform. You're probably noticing that this looks a little different than a Zoom platform. And, uh, and we are just having some, a few technical difficulties here. I hope that uh, we have resolved them and that you'll be able to hear everyone. Uh, Lori Libby, can you do a little test for me to make sure? Sure. Can you hear me, Jody? I can. I'm getting some really big feedback. How's this? Can you hear me better? It's a little better, yeah. Guys, can you hear uh, Lori Libby? Good afternoon, everybody. Just see if you can hear me. We were having some interesting experiences that I will no doubt take back to tech support when this is all over. Um, yes, I'm hearing, they can hear Lori. John, can you do a test? Make sure they can hear you. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. John Logan, can you hear me? Can we hear John? Not every webinar is gonna start this way, people, I promise. <laughs> Uh, I promise. Um, once I get a confirmation from somebody that they can hear John, it looks like they can hear John. So guys, whatever we were experiencing prior to this, I, I don't know, it's resolved itself. Hey, welcome to our webinar on civil unrest. I'm Jody Holstein. I am the executive director of the Iron Greater Denver chapter. And this has been a tough week for a great number of people. Before we even get started, I want to make sure that we take a moment and acknowledge that we have two things going on here. We have what happened in Minneapolis and the snuffing out of a life that we saw on the internet and that grief and that anguish and that cost goes in this bucket over here. And it can't be measured and we can't compare to that. In the meantime, all of my members and everyone in real estate has another bucket they have to deal with. Regardless of the anguish happening over here, there are issues that you now have to handle right away. And that is what today's webinar is about. How do we handle what is happening in this bucket, which is the civil unrest that is happening in our cities and around our buildings? And how do we prepare for that? Because guess what? I don't think we're seeing the last of this. How do we respond to it when it's happening and then how can we maybe prevent damage in the future? And what do we know, need to know from a legal aspect? So first I'm going to ask Lori to introduce herself, tell us just a little bit about herself. Uh, Lori, would you take the floor for a moment? Sure, thanks Jody. I appreciate you having this conversation for all of us. Um, we are, um, I work with Allied Universal Security Services and we provide a lot of the security to the downtown uh, high rise buildings um, and throughout the uh, Colorado um, state. So we've been experiencing a lot of the same things that you've been talking about, Jody, especially with having those two buckets um, and then figuring out how do we continue to keep our officers and our property safe um, in some of the fast turning things that have happened over the last couple of days. So I've been with the company for 13 years. Um, I've really kind of grown up in the industry and have a lot of contacts and um, I'm very honored to be here with you guys today. Thank you. And then we have John Logan, who's gonna help guide us through 
uh, some of the legal issues around what's happening here because they are vast. It's not just about a broken window. Um, everything that happens after it is very legal in nature. So John, you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, my name is John Logan. I'm a partner in the Cherry Creek Law Firm of Laugh Gordon Bennett Logan. I've been a real estate lawyer in Colorado for 36 years. I worked with Iram before teaching some classes and other programs for them, so it's good to be back. Fantastic. So uh, I'd like to begin uh, with Lori, and I, I know that um, as I introduced this topic, we talked about preparing for it, living through it, and then preventing it. I think where we want to start today is really what's happening right now, what it looks like when you're living through it. Uh, so Lori, if you would just take a moment and uh, and just kind of walk through some of the um, some of the things that you've seen and and expectations that a property manager might have if they're sitting in the middle of this. Lori, did you hear me? Lori, did you hear me? I can't. Oh, no. Now, okay. now, now uh, I can hear you. Come on, Mon Lincoln. There is Mon a disconnect now. between Lori and I, so you can hear me now? Yes. Okay. So what I said was I would really like to hear from you first sure. um, and talk with us about what it looks like when you're going through it and where um, a property manager sits amidst all of that's happening right now. Well, as we're going through it, things were happening so very fast. Um, and we had a lot of internal communication, a lot of connection with DPD. Um, we had shared radio service that um, a lot of property managers have the availability to take advantage of through the Downtown Denver Partnership. So we were able to continually have some feed about what was going on. Things changed very quickly for us. And um, I would say that most of us um, and most properties have emergency preparedness documents and have guidance for civil unrest um, and also have guidance for how we handle any kind of protest. What we have seen, the peaceful protest turn into the damage was different than what we've prepared for. And I think everybody would um, probably say that that was true. Um, <clears throat> we saw a lot of windows be broken. And for anybody who knows a lot about property management, obviously the windows are not meant to break easily. So there was a lot of intent there that was happening. We had a couple of buildings that were stormed a couple of times with additional security officers in there. And what we had to do was have internal management communication with our officers to make sure that everybody was remaining safe. It was kind of trying to figure out a time, is it safe to um, shelter in place? Um, are we communicating with DPD quickly enough to let them know what's going on? Do we have eyes on the properties from surrounding properties where we were able to li um, lend a little bit of mutual aid? So this, we've been doing this for, oh my goodness, I've lost track of time, but I feel, I think seven nights is, is accurate. Um, but the first two nights were, were pretty rough. The first night unraveled much quicker than we anticipated with all of the damage that we saw. The second night also then presented additional challenges where we had some of the buildings then boarded up and that presents a different um, view from a security standpoint of how we look outside these glass buildings. So traditionally we would see a nice open um, lobby with a lot of sunlight and now we have no eyes on the property. We're not able to see what's going on. Some of the deferred maintenance on cameras, which we see how quickly all those gum, you know, in and out left us with spots that some points we weren't able to see. So, um, you know, like I said, things unfolded really quickly. Communication with property management, um, you know, could only be as fast as we could get there. And also, you know, everybody had eyes on their properties and kind of knew what was going on. Our frontline um, responsibility at the time was officer safety. And um, like I said, as quickly as those things were moving, that's where we were. A lot of us connected with property management, kind of as things started to settle down a little bit, you know, later um, in the thick of things was was again more about officer safety and making sure that we didn't have any injuries to our officers. That's kind of how things unfolded for us. The next couple of days we did a lot of time surveying the properties, 
that were you know, severely damaged, um, looking at what the new security plan looks like with a boarded up property, looking at where we had eyes on the property from cameras, um, and then also, like I said, looking at those mutual aid buildings where we were able to maybe adjust some cameras to help make sure that our safety, our officer safety was in place. We also then had to take into some consideration, which is a little hard to talk about, but um, you know, we had to be concerned that this didn't turn into a assault on the uniform. And so we took some additional precautions um, for our security officers and asking them to um, you know, put on their uniform either at site or to, when they were leaving, make sure that they were out of it. We used unmarked vehicles that we have to transport people in and out of some of those hot zones that were um, during, you know, during shift change. We then also used some of our shifts to then switch to 12 hour shifts so that we weren't changing shifts at the same time and we weren't changing in some of those really hot moments. Um, and that we also then allowed our officers to stay on site if they didn't feel that it was comfortable to leave um, and kind of really honed in on how we could keep officer safety in place um, and working really closely with DPD. We also had National Guard that came in that stationed at several of our buildings. So I can tell you that we had <clears throat> DPD um, as well as all the surrounding agencies that were lending a hand those next couple of nights after one um, after night one start to come in. National Guard also came in. They stationed at several of the buildings. What was unique is some of the property managers also reached out and asked us to help put them in contact with some of these people so that they could offer up their buildings at the place for a bird's eye view um, or for them to station out of if they hadn't already come up with that plan. Their tactics were not public um, and you know that is by design. Um, but just from the amount of security that we have, I can tell you that they were stationed all across um, many properties and worked really closely with the property management team. So that's kind of how things unfolded for us. It was really fast. We've been up, um, you know, with the, the last um, reports of damage coming in from our officers, usually around two o'clock in the morning to three. And we, you know, usually then sleep till about, till about six to get up in the morning and then have our debriefs and then do some walks of properties and connect with our officers. Um, as well as, you know, now we also have to take care of our officers and make sure that um, any traumatic incidents that they're feeling from this are taken care of through our employee assistance program as well. So we're kind of just wrapping our arms around as many people as we can. But um, this certainly isn't the kind of normal um, thing that we plan for. So it's taken everybody a chance to um, revisit what those look like and look at um, the properties from a different level now that we have these different obstacles in front of us. Thank you, Lori. Um, I would like to now go over to John Logan. And John, um, tell us when you're actually going through something like this, what are the legal issues that as a property manager may run through your mind when all the chaos is, is swirling around? Certainly. Uh, can you still hear me? I can. Cody, can you hear me? I can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, good. All right, so so let me let me just first back up and and tell you a little bit about how I've seen this unfold. I have two clients that have office buildings downtown, both close to the state capitol. One building, pretty much all the glass on the 17th Street side was broken out. Uh, a lot of the glass on the 16th Street side was as well. Initial uh, quotes for damage were close to $200,000. This particular company has an insurance deductible of $250,000. So this was $200,000 that was coming out of pocket. In addition, there were a number of retail tenants whose glass was also broken. All of those, unfortunately, the repair obligations that, that for that glass fall directly on the tenant. They're not a landlord obligation. So you, each of these retail tenants now is faced themselves with having to go out and get new glass as well as removing graffiti and replacing an in inventory and that sort of thing. So um, another building, a few panes of glass broken out, uh, some attempted break-ins to the building didn't get in, but the back side of the building is an alley, and that has become the essentially the portalet for the uh, the demonstrators at the state capitol. They're using using that alley as their bathroom, so they're having to go out and hose that down. So I've got some clients who are experiencing this. 
I think one of the first things you look at is, all right, what are my rights as an owner, as a manager, to defend the property? And the first thing you have to do, or you have to remember, is you can't use deadly force. Colorado is not a state that allows the use of deadly force to protect property. The only time you can use deadly force is if somebody is attempting to commit arson. That's pretty much the only time that you are justified as a property owner in using deadly force to preserve property. Otherwise, you can use reasonable efforts to protect your property, but that doesn't include shooting somebody. So that's going to be something that, while well, other states do allow that, not so much in Colorado. So the amount of force that you can use has to be proportional to what's being done. Now, that's not to say you can't defend yourself individually. If you are in, in immediate danger of serious bodily harm, there are some law that says you can you can defend yourself with with a proportionate amount of, of force. Um, proportionate, obviously, in the circumstances is going to depend on what's happening to you. So the first thought, obviously, goes through everybody's mind is what what can I do? Can I chase them off? Can I call the? Can I swing at them with with a, a billy club? Can I pull my gun out? Can I shoot their? Can I kneecap them? No matter what, you know, all of those things you go through your head. Use of force is an absolute last resort. So, so that's the, the first thing you have to look at in terms of your responsibility. So the other thing you need to obviously have, and it's been touched on already, is you have to have an action plan. You have to have some kind of policy and procedure manual by which you you have a, a chapter in this. All right, civil unrest could be coming, could be having demonstrations, what do we do? What's our protocol? Make sure everybody's trained in that. Um, sometimes you're going to have to have a shelter in place plan for when the crowds are outside and you can't exit. So you need to have your policy and procedures in place to protect uh, your people. Another thing, um, you need to have a, a policy and procedure and plan for notifying your tenants. Generally speaking, in Colorado, we have a law. It's called the Premises Liability Statute. The Premises Liability Statute defines how people can, or how property owners and property managers can be sued for personal injuries that occur on a property. In case of a riot, obviously, you can tell there could be some personal injuries associated with that. Colorado law gives property owners and managers a duty, an obligation to protect their tenants or invitees from dangers hazards that you as a property owner or manager knew of a loose wire a puddle an ice patch or reasonably should have known about that and that's that reasonably should have known about that that gets people in trouble because when you get to who defines what you should reasonably know about it's not going to be a jury of property managers it's going to be a jury of people who are tenants typically who are going to decide what a reasonable property manager would do so in the context of protecting your tenants, there's going to be a duty on you to take reasonable steps in that regard. And that might include locking the building down during the context of a, a riot, not letting people out. Uh, that might be advising tenants that they should anticipate some periods of disruption. Um, it's also going to involve you or make you take some, some pretty practical and reasonable steps to protect your tenants and their property, including their vehicles and, and that sort of thing from damage. One of the first things that you ought to do as a property manager is, is do a perimeter sweep of your building. And all of that fist-sized river rock that looks so good in the flower beds around the building should pro probably disappear and be replanted, uh, be replaced by some sort of, of mulch, something that can't be a missile. Trash cans probably should be bolted down, uh, dumpsters ought to be chained uh, so they can't be moved, locked so they can't be opened and set on fire. Those are the types of things that you need to, to look at. You need to look around. Some cases there are claims that people are stashing cases of bricks and rocks in, in the area. Perhaps a good thing as these kind of events unfold is to perhaps do a sweep around the area to find out what sort of missiles, what sort of objects could be used or being placed there um, and making sure that the things that that can be picked up and thrown, 
loose patio furniture is another example, are, are put away. And, and so all of these kinds of hazards that could result in injury or damage, not just to your building, but, but to your tenants and your customers and their customers and invitees, um, all of those things have, have, been, have been ameliorated. Um, so those are the things that you look at, in my view, from the immediate response, the planning, the uh, sort of the preparation for, for these particular hazards. Two other th things you want to make sure that you do as a property manager and operating in a, in a building in a war zone uh, like this. Make sure you, your leases have, have clauses that apply. Make sure that your leases are really well written and, and create you know, the waiver, waivers of liability, uh, landlord's not responsible, no security pr is provided, those type, that type of language that will help insulate you, not bulletproof by any stretch, but will help insulate you. And then the insurance. The, the insurance is, is absolutely critical here in this kind of scenario. Not just the, for their tenants to have plate glass insurance, for the owner to have riot and and interrupt and uh, damage insurance as well, but but also to have the business interruption insurance, so that if your retail tenant is knocked out for a month, two months by looting, that they have insurance that steps in and, and has provides them with income to to pay for the rent, and finally the repair section, you need to make sure that it's very very clear who, who bears responsibility for damages. In the case of one client who has a building downtown with retail tenants, they're proactive. They say in their repair section that the tenant is responsible for plate glass. And you can get plate glass insurance. But if you're a ground floor tenant downtown, it's not just at a, a riot that the glass gets damaged. The glass downtown is tagged and etched on a regular basis, just randomly. And so you need to make sure that the repair responsibilities are allocated properly the costs are allocated and everybody's got insurance for those types of things. So it's, it's a matter, I think, of preparation because the last thing you want to have happen is to be a defendant in a premises liability lawsuit with somebody suing the landlord, suing the property manager because they got hit in the head with a rock that came from your, your flower bed and they have permanent brain injuries from that. The jury's going to hear from an expert who's going to say that property manager did not act in a reasonably prudent manner in allowing potential weaponry to be readily available right outside the front door. That's the kind. That's a kind of nightmare scenario you you really really want to try to avoid. And with that, I'll I'll step back and let Lori take the next set of questions. Thank you, Mike. Um, so we are. Um... I look like I'm sitting in the dark here. There's this dark cloud that has gone over me. I, I don't know. I don't know if it's a, if it's a sign of things to come. Um, but uh, uh, I've got a question here. A question of did any did either one of you have clients that experienced an injury of someone who was on their staff? I did not experience anyone that was on our staff. Thankfully, we took a lot of those measures, and um, just I was kind of thinking about John, your comment too, because I, I should have said yes. It goes without saying that we continually are serving the property, looking for those projectile type of things. Um, you know, we saw a lot of milk cartons that were in. Um, you know, a lot of the planters and things that had been planted ahead of time. So we've done a lot of those things and picking up some of those things. But yeah, we were very fortunate that um, so far and uh, no one has been injured um, on our team or on any of the property management teams that we're aware of. Good. And I'm not aware of anybody who's been injured as well. Let's talk a little bit about uh, planning ahead for, you know, preparing for something like this. Uh, talk about some of the relationships that you can make um, that might make this a little easier. Uh, so Lori, I'm going to start with you on that. Sure. Um, you know, I would say the first thing is 
really just have that open communication with your security team, um, whoever they are. We all have great security vendors out here. Um, and we're all very close and very close knitted. And many of us were talking um, throughout the night as all this stuff was unfolding as well. Um, additionally, any of your local police departments that you can connect with, um, anytime you can invite them into your building to get um, to do training or to take a look at the views that you have from your building so that they can become familiar with them um, is always nice. Um, it's nice to have those relationships um, and also to make some you know, friends, there's, there's different jurisdictions that do all sorts of different things. So really opening up um, that opportunity to have a, you know, coffee with a cop or any of those conversations to bring in. Um, they love to build those relationships. Um, in the downtown area, there also is the, um, the uh, business improvement district, and they also have a connected radio system that, like I said earlier, you can take advantage of um, that helps push out a lot of those alerts um, for anything that goes on in that downtown area. If there was an active shooter or anything like that as well, um, that's an additional program that they offer. Um, any of the public and private partnership groups are great to be a part of. Um, and like I said, I would talk with your local security vendor, or whoever your partner is in that to help connect you with those um, and just have some of these conversations. Um, they've been very beneficial for us because we've been able to call people um, you know, on the bike patrol and say, hey, we know that this is what's going on or to call District 6 or any of the people that are out there. We have cell phone numbers of direct calls um, when we need help um, during some of these incidents when some of the buildings were stormed. We had um, connections with as we were dispatched through other agencies. Uh, I think at one time Aurora was taking some of the 911 calls and filtering them back through. Um, that they knew who we were. And so that was really, you know, beneficial to make sure that we felt comfortable that that, was, that uh, call was being answered. So I would just encourage you, I'm a, I'm a networker by, by choice and by life. And so I would encourage you to really connect with your security people and then all of your police and fire and um, even your EMTs that are in the area just so that you know who those contacts are. And John- I would agree with Lori on all of that, particularly the, Yes, and groups like the uh, Downtown Denver Partnership, uh, trade associations, the, the the business districts, if you happen to be in downtown Littleton or someplace like that, connect with, with the business groups that are in that area, the property managers and owners that are in that area, and, and just create a, a, a network of people. The other person, the other group that I would get in touch with is going to be your insurance company, the insurance company for the building, because typically what the insurance company, they like to do an audit of buildings each year or every few years to, to check and see what kind of risks are associated with the building. And it might not be a bad idea to bring them in the loop because they're going to have the loss that you, you have and, and ask for their advice, ask for, for whatever recommendations. They, they may say, well, next time you go with a glass uh, replacement program, do something that's a, a standard glass and not a, a custom glass from Italy. One of the saving factors in one of the, these buildings that's a client of mine downtown is that a lot of the glass that was broken out happened to be on the ground floor, but in standard panel sizes. Had had the, the rocks gone up another floor, it would have hit special custom glazed imported glass that, that was 10 times more expensive to replace. So it, it may be something you just need to think of that, hey, um, if, if and when I need to replace the glass, let's let's do something that I can I can get off the shelf. Not that it has to come from overseas. So um, just be thinking proactively. Now, obviously, some of you have buildings that are going to be, it's highly unlikely that you're going to have riots running through your neighborhood. But you are going to have vandalism, no matter where you are, you're going to have vandalism, you're, you're going to have something strange happen. It, it just it just is. Um, I mean, I had a years ago, I had a, a client that had an employee, uh, the employee volunteered for a psychiatric facility, one of the patients became very enamored of him, was not permitted to enter his office building, so showed up at the base of this DTC office building in full mountaineering gear 
and started to climb the exterior of this DTC office building to peer in his seventh floor window um, and did a fair amount of damage to the, the channels and some of the glass and some of the, some of the facing of the building in, in her attempted ascent. So I'm not saying you're going to have somebody climbing your outside windows, but you are going to have weird stuff happen. And so you really, really do need to think about this. If it's not a riot, it, it might be a situation, for example, where you've got a uh, potential domestic violence situation or a, an, a terminated employee who is believed to be a threat to uh, employer, people, property that you need to keep an eye out for. So don't just think of this as, as, a, as a riot exercise. Think of this as, as a civil disturbance issue that, that fits in a lot of different boxes. I would also encourage the continue of tabletop and post incident um, conversations, right? So that we can talk about, you know, we when we do these tabletop trainings and we walk through these created scenarios that we do, we try to cover all of the what ifs. Um, obviously, we'll never cover all of those, but it can help get us through those plans. So I would just encourage you with your teams and everything, and as as things start to settle down and we look into that recovery mode, that you do take a time to do a post incident. Uh, walk through with all of the members of your team from janitorial to security to engineering, everybody that's there. Um, review the call trees, review what that looks like. Um, and, and you know, like John said, it could be for any kind of an incident. Um, you know, you can never get complacent in training or trying to figure out what these what ifs are, or, um, anything like that. But I, I would highly encourage a post incident review. Guys, how does it look? How does it look different? Commercial office versus multifamily. When, when you're talking about a, a downtown area and as integrated as housing and has become, you know, how do you how do you are there any distinct differences between how you would handle it commercially versus multifamily? Do you want to take that, John, or you want me to start with that? <laughs> it's, um, it's you know, your, your legal obligation, legal obligation as a landlord uh, is going to be the same. You, you have to protect your occupants, whether they are commercial occupants or residential occupants, from dangers in areas that you control, common areas, uh, typically, that you know or, or reasonably should should know about. Um, so you, you have this duty. Uh, and you, there's an infinite number of ways you, you can be sued. Um, in terms of residential, obviously, you, you, have, uh, you have to protect somebody from the building from being easily broken into, um, security cards, locks, that type of thing, the control access. That's really critical importance. Um, Jody, your, your comment, yeah, we do have multi multi-family uh, and retail often sitting one on top of the other. So it's... Um, it can be dangerous, of course, if you've got a retail premises on the ground floor that's looted and set on fire with with apartments above. Uh, but, you know, apartments standing alone and not not immune from this sort of thing. We've had a couple of cases within the last year where, for whatever reason, somebody's taken an accelerant, a can of gasoline and 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 dripped it down a, an apartment interior hallway and set an apartment building on fire. So so those things those things can happen anywhere, anytime. Yeah, from a security standpoint, um, same same thing. We, you know, review the property, decide where, what is our areas of responsibility and what we can control and can't control. Um, just some of the incidents that we ran into um, were people trying to get home um, during all of this who didn't know what was really happening. You know, some of our nurses and doctors and people coming off of shift um, late. And so there were streets blocked off. There were a couple of police escorts that helped to make sure that people got home in those instances, um, in those buildings where we do have um, the residential on top of our, our retail. Um, there were some concerns when some plywood went up and some people pre-boarded too, if we did see any more fires that were set, what that looked like from an escape route for everybody. And so that was a conversation um, that was had. Several of the people took, um, you know, wanted to know who was in the property too and made sure everybody was up to date on their fire life safety training as well. Um, so those were kind of some of the things that we ran into. And again, those were unfolding as quickly as, as you know, they were happening, so. 
So John, from a, a policy perspective, talk about, let's say you have a property manager on this side that doesn't have any policies, doesn't really have a plan in place, um, can't prove that they've uh, built relationships with police and, and done the things that they need to do. And then on this side, you have someone who has the policies in place, has the documented uh, trainings and, and everything. Where, how does that look different in a court case? How, how is that leveraged? So in a court case, in, in a, a premises liability court case, the plaintiffs will bring in a experienced property manager who's who has turned to the dark side, who has become an expert witness for the Frank Azars of this world for, for a small hourly fee. And, and that property manager, that, that expert witness, is going to offer an opinion. That opinion is going to be, this is the standard of care by which property managers ought to be viewed, ought to be graded. And if I'm a property manager or when I was a property manager, this is what I did. I had the emergency plan. I met with the fire department. I had all of these things in place to protect my tenants, protect my, my owner and to protect my tenants. And these are the reasonable precautions that could and should have been taken. They were not taken by this particular property manager. And as a result, injuries occurred. So all of this stuff, none of it's bulletproof, but it, these are all defenses that you're building to, to try to protect yourself. One of the things you, you really, really, really have to keep in mind here, is, and I've preached this in many of the classes that I've taught, is that when you talk about insurance, if you have a million dollars in coverage, you are underinsured. What happens is if you get sued and you have, say, for example, tenant who got damaged by a protester throwing a rock from your your flower garden and those damages are two and a half three million dollars you have a million dollars worth of insurance the insurance company writes a check for a million dollars and says we're done we're done and and the rest of it is on you so that means as the property manager you have to come up with if you got it the other million and a half that the plaintiff was awarded you never want to be in that position. You never, ever want to be in a position where the issue is not so much damages and who's going to pay for what, but whether there was liability in the first place. So, and that's what we're talking about here. This is, this is the, the ounce of prevention. This is taking those reasonable steps and, and, and making yourself the reasonably prudent property manager so that you can, you can stand up there and listen to this, this expert say, well, you know, this, this property manager did everything they were supposed to do absolutely everything and this was unavoidable that's where you want to be does a tenant uh or resident have a right to request the insurance documents and emergency policies and plans not pre-litigation no in litigation yes so they can't just they can't just come down to the office and ask for it at any point, even if there's nothing going on, they just kind of want it. No, no, it, it's, that's an internal business document. There's no legal basis by which a tenant commercial or residential can demand to see the property owner or manager's uh, emergency preparedness plan. That's, there's no legal compliance requirement for that, but, when you get into litigation and you're being measured by against what the reasonable property manager should do, that's fair game. That that stuff it can be produced and, and probably must be produced by law at that point. And I don't know, John, um, but I, I believe that a lot of some of the basic emergency guidelines for a shelter in place with a tornado, some of those things are listed out in those tenant handbooks as well that they're given when they're first leased out. We see a lot of that general information, but then our emergency you know, procedures with us and with the property management and what their company has is a much more robust document. I, I think it's prudent on the part of a particularly commercial property manager to, to have 
emergency drills. I mean, to, to have the fire alarm testing as an example. Um, and, and in the case of a potential riot, a potential civil disturbance, to send out an email blast to the tenants to say, this, is, this might be happening. Um, we're going to board up the building. We might even close the building for a couple of days, be prepared to work from home. Um, there is a curfew. You must be out of the building at curfew. Just going over tenants' reasonable and prudent things. Don't come in if you think it's risky. So, for example, one building that's downtown and is a client of mine, they, they basically sent out an email saying this has happened. We're, we're, we're boarding up the downstairs glass. Even though some of it hasn't been broken, we're going to board up everything. There is a curfew in Denver. Please advise your employees of this. Understand that it's a risky, risky time in downtown Denver and come in at your own risk. As a result, they went from probably 20% occupancy down to five uh, over this week. But it was people being smart. They, they told the tenants what was going on. The tenants were, all right, fine. We're going to make our own choices, we'll tell our employees and let the employees make their decisions. But that kind of shifts the burden onto the tenants to let their employees know. Okay. Uh, if anyone has any questions, now is the time to put them in the chat box uh, and let Lori and John be able to answer them. Uh, you know, we've got about, I don't know, 13 more minutes left of our hour. Um, if, if there's one thing that you've seen happen over the last week that you could say, man, if they only knew this, what would it be? Well, that's a nice hanger. <laughs> There's so many things. Um, you know, what goes back to me a little bit is, is the rocks. Um, you know, the, the while we were watching a lot of things unfold, I thought it was very interesting because um, I had been downtown surveying the damage with some of our people and they were bringing in the heavy front loaders. And I was listening to the news and monitoring my live streams that I was assigned to. And they kept reporting, they're building a berm. They're building a berm. They must be bu building a berm there in front of Civic Center. And it was, you know, made me chuckle a little bit because it wasn't, there was no building a berm. It was covering of the rocks. And um, from the pictures that we had seen, you know, of some pictures of damage that I had taken as well, um, you know, I'm like, well, there was the big pile of rocks. And those were a lot of the rocks that um, did turn into, you know, weapons. Um, that were easily accessible. Um, and then some of the even heaviest of planters that we thought wouldn't be turned over were turned over. Um, and some of those pieces were broken and used for, um, you know, ways to break glass and as well. So um, the, I, I don't know, there's so many things to that we could say on that from my end, but that would probably be the one thing that really has stuck um, with me was how beautiful those and nice those rocks were and how quickly they became um, launching items. Yeah, and I think we were all surprised by the violence of Friday night. I do remember, and for those of you listening, you, you might can picture this in your mind. So they just redid the bus terminal at the east end of the mall at Broadway near Colfax, and they made a beautiful new bus terminal. And there was a, sort of a little bit of an open area on the south side between the end of the bus terminal and Colfax. And they filled that with, with big river rocks. And, and I remember seeing that two years ago going and thinking to myself, you know, at some point we're gonna have a riot, we're gonna have a disturbance and somebody's gonna be picking up those rocks. And sure enough, one of the, the front end loaders that had come in soon after that were picking up what was left of those rocks. Many of them were had already gone through windows on the 16th Street Mall, but they, you know, the, the RTD supplied those missiles. I, I think the big thing that you're going to be looking at, when people wish they had known, is they, I wish we'd made a different landscaping choice um, and not put those there. I wish we had not had loose uh, furniture, that we maybe had fixed benches, those types of things. Um, wish we'd put up the plywood sooner. 
uh, as soon as we, we had wind that this was going on. And, uh, and whoever comes up with the, the anti-graffiti coating um, is going to make a mint. Uh, you can just spray a coating on, on windows. It keeps the, the, the spray paint from sticking. That's, that's going to be a growth industry, sadly. I think it's interesting that you're bringing up the rocks. As someone who's not a property manager, I walk by and whenever I see mulch, I go, God, what a waste. It's just going to blow away. Um, and I see the rocks and I go, now there's some thinking that's going to last forever. I would have never thought, gosh, that's a bad choice um, at all. So uh, that is that I'm going to look at rocks now in an entirely different way. Um, thanks to you guys. I, I want to send out a quick poll here. Um, everyone on the phone uh, and just ask, uh, what's the status of your preparedness plan? Is it good to go or does it need some work based on what you saw this week? Um, and if it needs some work, that's okay. Uh, now's a great time to take a look at it and say, wow, um, we better get some things in order here. Uh, and it, I think that we, have, we are surrounded by some really great vendors. And I know we have people on our call today that are uh, from, uh, from other states and from IRAM chapters in other states. And, I know that you guys have some great vendors as well that I am sure would be happy to help create that preparedness plan and look it over um, so that you can have what you need. Uh, right now, uh, I am showing we are at 40% of the people on the call are good to go. 60% say we need some work on that. And so th this, if nothing else, can be an eye opener to be able to identify those rocks in your plan, um, should I say, uh, that, that need to be removed or replaced with something else. Um, as, as we close up here, um, John, do you have any final comments, any things that you want to you want to just say and, and make sure people understand? Yeah, I think I just want everybody to know that, that something's going to happen to your building at some point. It might not be a riot. You might not have people storming through the, the common areas, throwing rocks at everything. But but you're going to have a casualty event. You're going to have some vandalism. You're going to have some crime. You're going to have something happen. It's super critical, super important to be prepared, to have the right documents, the right lease, the right insurance, the right relationships. All of those things need to be in place so that, yeah, it's going to happen, but you're prepared. So just be a Boy Scout. Be prepared. Lori, any final comments from you? Um, I will just say that it has a, it's a, a week that's been heavy on our hearts and um, you know we're thankful for everybody that partners with us and are there to support everybody as well. I would encourage post-incident conversations, trainings, um, tabletops, walk through at that time. It's a great time to review your emergency procedures. And like I said, I just want to reiterate connecting with your security vendors and helping them, I'm mean, helping um, ask them to help you make those connections with DPD um, or whoever your police agency is as well. And um, if it so moves you, um, there is cleanup that's taking place as well on Friday uh, downtown if you're interested in joining as well. So thank you for the opportunity, Jody. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Jody. You are welcome. And the last question I had come in was, is this being recorded? Yes. If I set it up correctly, Jen, it is recorded. Uh, and so all of you on this call will get a, uh, an email from me with a link to the recording that you can share with uh, anyone in your office 
or really anyone in the industry, there will also be a uh, link to it on our website under our education tabs uh, as well. So thank you. And uh, it looks like the storm moved over me. And uh, John was a little sketchy. I was thinking, okay, it's in Centennial now. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for attending. And uh, I will also put in that email Lori's contact information as well as John's contact information if you want to get a hold of either one of them to assist you in helping with your preparedness plan. Have a great evening. And uh, we will hopefully um, be doing a whole lot of preparing and not a whole lot of using uh, in the future. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Judy. Bye-bye.